Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. The key to this business is personal relationships. (laughs) Dickie Fox. (laughs) The late, great Dickie Fox, my mentor. That was a reference from Jerry Maguire, and sometimes we let you in on the banter, the pre-recording, really good stuff that goes on in the studio. So welcome to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. We're in the midst of a series on interpretation. And, oh, it's just huge, getting great, great feedback on this and urge you to tell your friends about Ransomed Heart. Tell them about the podcast. It's free and it's awesome and it will help bring them into just the whole treasure chest of content and gospel that we have here. By the way, I'm John Eldridge. I think that's probably fairly clear by (laughs) now. Greg McConnell with me. To his left. And we've been walking through interpreting our lives, interpreting our internal world, interpreting God and his actions or seeming un, you know, involvement in prayers or in our lives. We've been interpreting disappointment and suffering. We thought that this time for this section we would talk about interpreting relational issues, again, kind of pushing into what are the categories that you use to sort out relational issues? Because again, we are bringing interpretation to our world all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, yesterday I texted a guy that I needed to set up a lunch with, and he doesn't know it. But part of this lunch is to discuss some difficult things between us. And last I checked... Oh, by uh, the way, I couldn't make Tuesday, but Wednesday's open. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and do it live on, yeah, the, yeah. on the show here today. <laughs> and last I checked, he hadn't texted back. And so this morning I get up and I'm thinking, whoa, he never responded. You know, he knows what's coming Oh boy, things are accelerating in terms of tension, you know, possible irreconcilable differences, et cetera. And then I pick up my phone this morning and saw, well, no, actually, he texted me back yesterday and said, love to, looking forward to it. <laughs> I just thought, first off, there it is again. Like, we are constantly interpreting in relationship. Words that are said, words that aren't said, Mm -hmm. facial expressions. And can I also point out that it's almost always negative. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm alone in that, you know, when someone doesn't return your call, return your email, when you don't get invited to the, you know, small group dinner or the baseball game. I mean, don't you just tend to go to the negative interpretation as opposed to the positive one? Yeah, I think it's probably pretty common. We always view our motives in the best light and intend to view the motives of others in the worst or suspiciously. Oh, my goodness. Yes. But, but John, the reason we need help here is relationships are just such a key part of our desires, our yearning, what we're made for in life. We're designed for relationship. And It's also probably the source of most of our conflicts is just broken, conflicted relationships and just kind of a trail, perhaps, of wounded relationships. And Mm -hmm. it's like this is one of those key areas to how do we understand this? How do we understand him or her or myself? Yes. Yeah. So, again, let's start with. You are interpreting yes. your relationships. Yeah. And your interpretation might not be accurate, which in many cases is a really hopeful thought. Yeah. You know, in, in my case, it was negative and gloom and doom and oh boy, you know, and it 
turns out that that was completely untrue. It wasn't even based in reality. Yeah. Isn't our experience here as a team, John, or maybe I should limit it to my experience, but after a while, I'm just suspect of other people, their actions and motives. And then you spend 15 minutes together and you remember, ah, oh, they've got a good heart. They're a great person. Yes. Why was I thinking that about yes. them? Yes. Yes. So, Craig, where do you want to go with this? With the categories that we think in, your own mm -hmm. struggle in the arena, what comes to mind when we dive into interpreting in relationship? Yeah, John, one of the first things that comes to my mind is something you often say in a, a boot camp to the men. If you know a man's story, you understand so much about him, and you use the illustration of uh, grandpa's kind of quiet, withdrawn, and, and drinks a lot. And would it change your relationship or response or understanding of him if you knew that he was in the 101st Airborne and went through fierce combat and that what his story involves pain and loss and hurt and just horrific things. There's, I think, when it comes to interpreting what's going on in relationships, one of those bottom lines is, do you know the story of the people around you? You know, if you're having a conflict, if there's something going on, if you understand a man or a woman's story, you understand so much about why they behave, why those irritating things are a part of their life, and kind of what's going on. That seems one huge thing. Huge. I think early in our marriage, Stacy and I were both young believers and kind of filled with that excitement and passion of, you know, first coming to Christ. And I think we were both in the posture of, hey, the past is past. Everything's future, you know, and we were so future focused. So, you know, what's happening yes. today with God and that we didn't take this seriously. We didn't take your counsel seriously. And it was only after pain, misunderstanding, kind of a continual cycle of, you know, misinterpreting one another's actions and words that we had to go back and realize, oh, all this stuff is rooted in our story. Yes. So we would say strongly, friends, that certainly for those in your immediate relational circle, you need to actually yeah. hear their story. Yeah. You know, if you haven't asked them, you want to do that. You want to share with one another. And I would say certainly within families, mm -hmm. close friendships, but my goodness, that also extends out to your small groups, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people that would fit within kind of your mm -hmm. immediate relational world, mm -hmm. you want to know their story. Yeah, yeah. And it explains so much. And know your own story, you know. Why am I so irritable around these people or situations? You know, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the intents or motives of the person. I mean, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, bless those who persecute you, bless those who curse you, so on. No matter what is going on, the command of God and the life we're offered is to love. Mm. And if I find my internal world is anything other than what could be described as love, putting the other person first or responding in courage and strength and compassion, Rather than asking, what's wrong with them? Why are they so unloving? Rather than finding some reason to withdraw or withhold love, I think when it comes to interpreting what's happening, you have to ask yourself the question, what is it about me that finds it so hard to love them? Mm. I think external circumstances, relational circumstances and difficulties point to us reflecting on internal realities. Yeah, that's huge. I noticed, again, kind of in my young years as a believer, these weren't categories that I thought in my 20s as a young man, but I did notice a pattern of not trusting and being pretty angry with older men. Uh -huh. I just didn't trust them. You know, they would blow it. They would disappoint. And my reaction would just be, I knew it. You know, 
And, of course, that's deeply rooted for me in a father wound and abandonment and you can't trust the older men, which is not true. I've known some wonderful older men and <laughs> Craig's phone goes off. Uh, hey, there's a pizza special tonight. I love this. Is that your little, <laughs> is that your little alert there? Yeah, yeah, I'm turning it off. <laughs> you got to love me. I do love you. <laughs> Everything about you. And then, yeah, just another example would be I was having coffee with a guy this weekend, and he's got a tough marriage. And I think, as is the case of many of our listeners, you know, they love this message. They're finding a deeper life with God. They're finding much more personal healing, breakthrough, clarity. And they're beginning to operate in a much fuller experience of Jesus and his kingdom than their spouse is. Mm -hmm. And that's a hard place to be. And for this guy, his wife's pretty guarded and mm -hmm. pretty hard. And her story explains why. But as we were talking about, his experience, and he was going straight to, what do I do to fix this? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to say, whoa, 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 pause. First, you just have to invite Jesus into it, into your disappointment. You can't start with them. Mm -hmm. You always have to start with you. Yes. You know, it's the log in your eye, the speck in theirs. And I don't think Jesus is trying to minimize other people's issues in that parable. I think what he's just trying to say is, look, you've got to begin with yourself. Yeah. And what are these disappointments, infuriating experiences, continual, you know, explosions? What's that saying about yeah. you and what you're bringing to the relationship? Yeah. So woundedness, gang, can we just say, I hope woundedness is one of the basic categories mm -hmm. you think in in relationship? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether it's in your relationship with your children as a parent or your spouse, people you work with, or Joe next door, there's one of the key interpreting kind of lenses as you put it, John, is what is God after in me in my journey of knowing him as father, is the journey of him growing me and that sanctifying, that work of holiness going deeper? What is it about these irritating people and relationships that God is using to go after stuff? It's so often our woundedness he's going after. And our style of relating, mm -hmm. because you need to keep in mind, friends, another category of interpretation is you have a style of relating and they have a style of relating. And sometimes it's, you know, oil and water. Mm -hmm. And again, what's so easy to point to, man, it's just their stuff. But are you aware of your effect on others? Are you aware of your presence, what your presence elicits? If what you're struggling with is that people don't seem to pay attention to you, have you given some thought to that's actually your gravitational mm -hmm. pull? You hide. You don't initiate. You wait to be invited in. You know, there's just signs posted all around your <laughs> relational boundaries, unavailable, guarded, protected, nobody's home. You're projecting that into the situation, or another example would be a dear friend of mine who what he projects is, I don't need you. Hmm. And this is a bright kid, and he's smart, and he's sharp, and he's moving fast, and he's you know super gifted in, the, in his Christian community. And the persona that he brings into the situation is, I don't really need anything from you. Mm -hmm. And then he wonders why he doesn't get invited to Super Bowl parties <laughs> and backpacking trips and that kind of thing. And he's, well... Your relational style is sending a message. Yeah. What's the message? Yeah. What's the message your relational style is sending? Yeah. Well, you're hitting close to home there, John, because as you know, my style is to move away from people despite these bursts of warmth and gregarious, sociable, you know, likability and this grandfatherly persona that you experience from time to time. I could just go on and on. But uh, <laughs> there's something about my sinful way of relating where I pull away, move away from people. 
and people take it personally. They feel like I don't give a hoot about them or life or relationship, and I'm just hiding. I'm running from God, and I'm running from mature, good life, life God intended me to have, and to enable me to withdraw from people and pull away. I've got to have a good reason. So my internal world is an awful lot of judging. Mm. You know, you're not a kind person. You're selfish. You're a little arrogant. That gives me every reason in the world to back off and move away. And so I'm saying amen to relational style, both in who I'm relating to, what's their style. I'm not going to let that hinder me. And then for me to be aware of mine, Hmm. why the party? Am I just so critical? It gives me good reason to just withdraw. Hmm. Hmm. And that's always misinterpreted in a personal way. I don't intend. It's my brokenness, not theirs, that's the issue. And friends, while we're offering these categories, let me pause and say we did an entire series on this. We did a 10-part series on relational issues and relational freedom, and that's available on our website in our bookstore called Relational Freedom. So we're going to hit on a few things today, but this is such a big one. Yeah, Everybody lives in this. Everybody lives in a relational world, and we are bringing interpretation to it. So we're going to give you a few categories right now, but strongly want you to go get that Relational Freedom series and dive deeper into this. And there's something that occurs to me now, Craig, that I don't know that we mentioned in that series. And just in terms of what are some of the basic categories you think in in relationship? And one of them is just the partial. We live in a broken world. Mm -hmm. Our hearts are made for laughter Mm -hmm. and joy Mm -hmm. and intimacy and friendship and rich, rich relationship. That's what we're made for. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world where we're broken, other people are broken, the world is so messed up that, yes, while we believe that substantial growth, breakthrough is available, there's just some grace. There's some grace for ourselves and for others to just recognize the partial, Mm -hmm. right? We are living with the partial, And Stace and I will go through seasons where, you know, our marriage is really good. And then we go through seasons where it's just kind of routine. We're just, you know, getting by and we're busy. And actually, we're not connected at all. Mm -hmm. You know, she's off doing stuff, good stuff. I'm off, you know. We might even be involved in other people's crises. But that's okay. Like, there's just a recognition of that's okay. Like, I bless the partial. You know, you and I don't get as much time together as either one of us would like. Mm -hmm. You know, we would love to have more Mm -hmm. space in our lives for that. It's not going to happen. We have full worlds. We fight for the time we do get. And I think I just want to say I bless the partial Mm -hmm. to just have a posture and relationship of, man, if you're demanding or even just aching and yearning for a fuller, richer relational life, It might help you to just bless the partial, you know, gosh, my mom hasn't called for a couple weeks. I sure wish she'd pay more attention to what's going on in our kids' lives, you know. But she does. Mm -hmm. She does. And I bless the partial, that kind of thing. See what I'm saying? Like, oh, I wish wish our small group would meet more often. It just seems like something always gets in the way. Mm -hmm. But you do meet. And it is good when you meet. And I bless the partial. You see what I'm saying? Oh, that... yeah. Yeah. Because it's the partial, John, I think feeling disappointment in relationships is inevitable. And where my mind's going right now is Christ. I think it's in Matthew 26 where he takes his closest disciples into the garden mm. to pray. And mm. he asks them to stand watch as he goes a little farther and and just crying out to the Father. And he comes back and checks on his buddies, his closest friends, and they're sleeping. And he does that twice. And what's beautiful about it is he expresses to those close friends his disappointment. Mm. Couldn't you Mm. 
stay alert and watch for one hour. The letdown, he's going through incredible personal crisis and those closest to him let him down. But it doesn't deter his relationship with the Father, nor does it deter Mm. his mission. It's like there's this example in Jesus of, I live in disappointment, but it doesn't deter, and I'm honest in how I handle that disappointment. So there's, Mm. in that partial, one of the breakouts from that is, yeah, there's disappointment relationships, and we can't let the partial in relationships deter us from the intimacy with God or the mission we're given. Or pursuing the relationship. Yes. Because as you're describing this, here's what's going on inside of me. I'm suddenly thinking of a relationship that I have, a guy that I try and do something with a couple times a year. Last year, we didn't get together. And frankly, by his choice, not by mine, Mm -hmm. I can already feel the posture in me of, I'm not going there this year. Like, I'm not going to risk that disappointment. So, gang, I bless the partial can really help you not react to the disappointment in Mm -hmm. bad ways. I'm pulling back, I'm pulling away, or whatever your style is, I'm Mm going to get pissed and, you know, force them to get together, you know, come through for me, whatever that looks like, share more, be more intimate. You know, the sense of be aware that the disappointment can often cause you to react in ways that I think would be different if you just allowed, my goodness, everyone's life, everyone's life is brutal. (laughs) It's brutal. It's a quote that gets misattributed several places. I finally looked it up and found that it was to a Scottish pastor named John Watson who said, be kind for everyone you know is facing a great battle. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just think if I'd look at my friend, you know, who didn't want to get together last year, I think if I just look at his life and go, my gosh, he's under siege. His life is like mine, you know, strained at every point, very little room for relationship. It's not like grace, mercy, be kind. Mm -hmm. Everyone you know is facing a great battle. John, I'm thinking of some category. It's a little vague. Maybe you can put words to it, but... But it feels like one of the categories in interpreting relationship is just understanding that there's different levels of relationship or that a lot of them are transitory, that we have seasons and and that relationships change. I don't know what the thought there is, but it feels like over the course of time, there has to be some grace given to yourself and others that things change and people move in and out and it's hmm. it's not failure perhaps on their part or your part. Do you know what I'm saying there? Oh, it's huge. I'm already thinking and just immediately went to some guilt that I still carry over a relationship with a guy who was a really great friend of mine in my 20s, into my 30s, but we haven't reached out to each other in years. Yeah. I mean, I moved to a different state. He moved to a different state. We moved on in our careers. You know, it's just relationships do have a season to them Mm -hmm. and an Mm -hmm. ebb and a flow. And whereas marriage, you know, is a lasting lifetime covenant. Yes. Other relationships have seasons to them. And some friendships aren't meant to last forever. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Some mentor relationships aren't meant to last forever. That's okay. You know, Christian fellowships and small groups and communities aren't meant to last forever, and that's okay. You know, just a a grace that there is an ebb and a flow to these things. And, you know, again, I think I want to say clearly, I think within a marriage context, you're fighting for that relationship for the rest of your life. But I think in other cases, there's the freedom to say, God, is this relationship changing? And Mm -hmm. Are we just moving on? You know, Mm -hmm. things have changed and no accusation, no blame, no guilt. You know, that's just the nature of these things. Yeah. You know, we haven't said it in this particular topic throughout the series. And just to say it, to ask Jesus, what's going on in this relationship? Lord, what's going on? How do I interpret or understand Mm -hmm. either my reaction or their behavior? Mm. You know? Huge. 
ask <laughs> Jesus from the small things like, why didn't this guy answer my text? Yeah. You know, and Jesus can say, well, actually, he did. Check your phone. You know, <laughs> to the big things. Lord, whoa, what was that blow up about? Or why has this person pulled mm-hmm. away from me? Or mm-hmm. why do I want to bail on, like, come in, Jesus. Yeah. Interpret this for us. I don't think we can go much further, Craig, without naming the category of warfare as well. I mean, I yes. I continue to be just stunned, stunned at how little this category plays into people's interpretation of their world, the typical Christian especially, when it's just rife throughout Scripture. It's everywhere. But my goodness, what a help this is. What a blessing this is. This is a really, really helpful category yes. to have the fact that, of course, your relationships are opposed. In, as you interpret things, is the enemy mm-hmm. up to something here? Mm-hmm. You know, those very strong feelings that you have when so-and-so walks in the room, has it ever occurred to you that those feelings aren't even yours? Yeah. Like, what an epiphany that can be. Oh, you just, everything in you just wants to get irritated at so-and-so. What an amazing thought to hear from Jesus. Oh, actually, that's just the warfare set against them or against your relationship. Actually, that's not even real. That's not how you feel towards Mm -hmm. them. I mean, it's, this is a big one. Yes. Gang, this one will provide a lot of relief, actually, if you'll allow for, oh, right, as I interpret relationships, I've got to bring warfare into it. Yeah, I think it's, it's just as we've said before, you know, warfare, woundedness, sin, and just desire are just always intertwined with relational things. I long for something that I only get partially. The enemy is definitely involved in destroying. My woundedness works against the loving heart and actions I'd love to have. I mean, those are just key lenses. Especially, let me give you, for an example, pushback. When there's just something in you that says, I just, I don't want to reach out to this person. I don't want to return their call. I don't want to return their email. I mean, stop and invite Christ into that. Because in my experience, what's often going on there is that's really actually not even my real heart toward them. That's the enemy And oftentimes the reason is because some great redemption is coming, you know, and so he's trying to just throw cold water on what feels like desire Yes. when actually if you could get that warfare off of you and let your true heart surface, you're like, actually, no, I love this person. Whoa, what's with the pushback? Mm -hmm. Well, the pushback isn't them Mm -hmm. and it isn't you, right? It's the enemy. You know, this is as old as the Garden of Eden, divide and conquer. Yeah. And the enemy knows, separate us, and then he can wreak his havoc. Yeah. Remember, this is a while back, Lori shared that a couple wanted to have dinner with us. And just remember my first response is, ah, oh, it'd be hell, <laughs> dinner, <laughs> you know, at their house, right. you know, not the controls of a restaurant, and just that... There's no way I'm going to spend three hours with this couple. I I don't know how it happened. I think God intervened. But I actually paused and just said, oh, Lord, Jesus. You know, I was looking for Jesus for his siding with me. (laughs) And there's something more useful for my evening than spending with them. And I just remember say, Craig, what do you really want? What do you really want this evening? And I thought, ah. To bring your kingdom, to reflect your heart, to be your man. And I just realized, okay, I'm in. Let's go. You know, <laughs> and it was it was just what you're saying. I mean, if God hadn't intervened or I hadn't turned to him, I'm not sure which that was. But I would have just been crotchety all evening, just resisting and fighting. Mm-hmm. And when my true desire wasn't to avoid something, it was to bring something. I don't know how often. I want to say 90% of the time, when it's something that God is actually in, Uh I feel that. Yeah. 
you know, trips I need to take, visiting people, weddings I'm invited to, or, you know, just <laughs> any variety of things, phone calls, da 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 If actually it's something that God is really in, the enemy almost always brings that, oh, really? <laughs> you know? So heads up, gang. Like, as you're interpreting your relational experience, heads up to the enemy, you know, that person's warfare, yes. your warfare, and then just the warfare in between you where the enemy was just trying to discourage, dismay, misinterpret. There's so many more categories to, mm-hmm. to bring to this. I'm remembering Longfellow's line where he says, we may meet a man and think him cold when he is merely sad. Mm-hmm. And we just misinterpreting people's cues to yeah. us and we don't know what they're going through and so ask Jesus mm-hmm. ask Jesus but before you come to conclusions before you choose certain actions before you just respond the way you kind of traditionally respond like Jesus what's going on here help me understand this relationship typically the fruit of that is almost immediate compassion now, yes, maybe some counsel, direction, and he may have, you know, some guidance for you to pull back or the season is ending or, no, push deeper, go after this person or, hey, this is warfare. Bring the cross of Christ against it. But ask Jesus in your interpretation of your world. Yeah. And again, we just want to say we've got a phenomenal relational series. Craig, I enjoyed that one. Yeah. Killer. Yeah. Yeah, I think the relational series, highly recommend, goes into a lot more. I think if the relational issues are marriage, I think love and war is a great resource on that front, too. Yeah, really good. So turn there. The relational series is called Relational Freedom, and that's Mm -hmm. an audio resource available on our website. And then Love and War is both a, a book and a video series. It would be really good to go through. We're going to hit a few more of these. We've got a few more subjects left in the series, and we'll be back with you next time. This is John Eldridge, Craig McConnell. You've been listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast. 